The broadcast is now. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Enhanced Vision webinar, um, Adapting to Visual Impairments, Learning to See it through Visual Impaired Eyes. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Kevin Hoff uh, from the Under Low Vision Resource Center in Arizona. So I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Hoff. Good morning, Dr. Hoff. Good morning, Gary. Uh, thanks again to uh, Enhanced Vision for allowing me to present um, this topic, uh, Adapting to Visual Impairment, Learning to See Your Vision in Your Eyes. Uh, we chose to uh, use this topic um, because I think one of the skills that I see in my patients um, that really is a, a very good predictor of success um, when I'm working with my patients with visual impaired is how well they've learned to adapt and, and specifically how well they've learned to use uh, the remaining part of their vision. Um, and so we're going to spend a lot of time on that today. Uh, I always start off just talking about um, what our goal is when we're working with, with someone who is visually impaired. Uh, obviously one of the biggest things that, that happens is uh, there's a lot of fear involved with it um, when you're first diagnosed with a visual impairment. Um, the biggest fear that most people are going to be faced with is the loss of independence. Um, I always tell people that decreased visual acuity really it does not have to lead to a, a loss of independence. There are certain things that are going to be harder um, and that you will be more reliant on other people. Um, but for the most part, uh, people are able to stay quite independent um, as long as we embrace some of the tools that are available. Um, throughout, this presentation, I do, um, throughout this presentation, I do have slides. Um, the slides are, are hopefully to help keep me on task and, and keep me in the um, speaking about the topic. Um, if you can't see the slides, don't worry about that. Um, I will describe pretty much every slide that we go through. Um, we have different tools that we are able to use. To help someone uh, keep their end of here that we have is education and using your eyes more efficiently. Now, um, I've, I've uh, had the opportunity with Enhance to speak on some of these topics more in depth, but I do want to hit some points. All topics one in itself can help someone use their eyes um, and help them uh, stay more in begin with, we talk about enhancing contrast. And this is a, a tool that, frankly, people can usually do on their home, in their homes, uh, outside of anything a doctor needs to prescribe. And it's also something that can be as helpful as anything I can prescribe. When we say um, enhanced contrast, the best way to describe that is a lot of people realize it's a lot easier to see things that are black and white as opposed to gray and black. Um, the best example of that is the newspaper. The newspaper is printed on paper that is not white, um, and because of that the contrast is, is pretty low, um, it seems to be getting worse. Um, and so uh, anytime we can enhance that contrast, it can make it easier to see. I have some slides here that we can go through. Uh, these are some pictures of coffee being filled up. The upper picture, the upper left, uh, is a white mug with black coffee being poured. Well, that white mug but the black coffee is a very strong contrast. It's easy to see where the, where the coffee is, um, so you're not as likely to over pour. Um, down in the lower right picture, there's a darker mug where it's harder to see that dark coffee. Uh, another example of contrast would be um, these dishes. Um, I have the same plate setting, uh, same white plate, and white mug, and white napkin with silver on it. In the upper picture, it's a lot easier to see because there's a dark placemat underneath it. And the contrast between the placemat and the white plate is a lot easier to see than when you have that white plate on a nice, beautiful white lace um, placemat. And so even though the, the bottom one may be clear, it, it's very hard to see. And then when you go to put something on your plate, it may be harder to see where that plate starts and where it ends. Um, this is a picture of someone who has laid out the, the pills that they'll be taking. The white pills on the white countertop blend right in and it's very hard to see, whereas what the person who laid it on the gray mat can see those white pills much easier. Um, when you're using uh, household appliances, a lot of times we will use stickers 
uh, like what's demonstrated in this picture where we put a blue sticker on the coal and we put a red sticker near the hot and we have a little green sticker on the knob. So we just know when you line that green line up with the blue, you have the coal. When you line the green line up with the red, um, there's hot. And there's lots of different systems you can choose to do, but you find this test. Uh, a filter, a yellow tint, um, because in their own home, very good way to help you um, see through your visually impaired eyes. We like to increase illumination. Now, when we increase illumination, um, some facts about that that are important to understand. A person in their 80s, um, even someone who is not visually impaired, um, just the normal aging of the eye, that person in their 80s is going to require about three times as much light as a 20-year-old, and that's mostly because their contrast sensitivity has decreased with age. Um, a person is going to even need even more lighting than that. Um, when we're talking about uh, lights, People always want to know what's the best type of light, and, and sometimes that can be a hard thing for me as the duck color we use, but how we have a position. Um, simply because that light has been positioned closer to the paper. So here's an example of their face, and now they're getting good direct light um, without increasing glare. And so here's another picture of a little task lamp that can be used to help see cards. A lot more options. Um,
that's pointing toward you, um, that can make it a lot harder. So if you always get those lights sitting behind you, that makes it easier on you. Um, some of our patients have conditions like anorexia where they, they just frankly don't have an iris to block the light and we'll use things like contact lenses that will block some of that light. Here's some pictures of some different colors of, of uh, sunglasses that we use. Um, patients often ask me which color is the best color and again that's something that is very individual. I have some patients who, boy, um, they're so light sensitive that we have to go with the darkest gray we can find. And even though that's decreasing their vision some, at least it's tolerable. Um, and so we go with the real dark gray. Some patients will tell me we'll have to wear sunglasses because it makes it too dark. A lot of times what we'll find is if we try a, a lighter brown or a yellowish brown or even a yellow or orange, um, it'll cut that glare um, for the patients, but it'll also keep it bright enough um, that they'll still be able to see it. It also enhance the contrast. Indoors, we do a lot of yellow tints because that yellow is very good at cutting that glare, enhancing the contrast, and still keeping things bright enough for someone to see. Um, another tool that we use so far, we, we talked um, about contrast and illumination and glare control. Another tool that's very important is sound. Um, a lot of my patients use sound to their advantage. Um, they will use talking watches, talking clocks. Um, there are really a lot of different products available that can use sound. Um, again, watches and clocks, we have scales that talk. A lot of our patients have diabetes and they need to manage their weight, um, but maybe they don't see well because of the diabetic red box, they can see their scale. Well, uh, we have scales that will read out the, the way to you. Um, people tend to want to do that in the privacy of their own home, though, because uh, it's not always fun to have someone uh, standing next to you hearing, uh, hearing the sound of your weight called out, but, but it is a helpful tool. Um, audio books are something that we, uh, we use a lot of. Um, the actors who read those books uh, make books engaging, um, and a lot of patients have adapted to uh, reading books with their ears. Um, one of the big new ways that we're using, new ways that we're using sound um, to our advantage is all our new CCTVs, our electronic magnifiers, now have a page and then read, read the print back to you. And I'm going to show you some example later in the talk. Also have very poor hearing. So when that's the case, sound is not as good a tool, but but it is important to consider all the options. And and again the talking So now I really, really want to get into what I, I hope you're, you're going to leave this webinar understanding, and that is how to use your eyes and the tools that you have more effectively. Is going to take some amount of practice to, to get back. What we say is for every uh, week that they have not been able to read, it usually will take at least about a day of practice. And so um, a patient who hasn't been reading you know, for, for six months, you know, they could be looking at a, a good month before they can really uh, get back to where they're reading more efficiently. Now when I say practice, um, people often say, well, it's not like I've I forgot how to read, um, but what's happened is they're having to learn how to read differently. And what I mean by that is when we read, um, as we get more and more proficient with reading, we get to where we're not having to look at every letter and every word. Um, I have a six-year-old who's in first grade at home, and we do a lot of reading in the evenings with her, and I've noticed that as the years gone by, 
she has gotten to where she sounds words out less, and that's because she's starting to identify words um, quickly um, and, and with memory. And so um, that's a good example of what our brain does as we read. We, we get to where we don't even have to see the next word. Um, we just can kind of, in the context of what we're reading, based on the, um, what the sentence is saying and what the shape of the next word appears to be in our peripheral vision, we already know that word. And so um, when we really look at how adults read, we only read every few words. We don't look at every single letter and every word. The problem is, a lot of the patients I work with, the part of the eye that's used to see the next word before you actually get to it, well, that's been damaged. And so those patients are faced with the fact that they have to look at every word and every letter as they go. And in fact, a lot of times in my exams, as I'm working with someone, I say, okay, here's some glasses we're going to try. Let's have you read that. And they'll begin reading to me. And if they were reading this slide that's up there right now, they would say, for every week a person has not read. And at that point, they look up at me and they say, boy, I feel like I'm in first grade. And I say, well, you know, the truth is, is um, physically, they are having to read like we did when we were in first grade, like my daughter, because they are having to look at every letter and every word. Because if they don't, um, a lot of times, uh, because they're missing that piece of the retina that's allowing them to uh, see the next word um, before they get to it, they'll, they'll guess and they'll get it wrong. And once you get it wrong, that context is off. So um, the, the good news about all that is um, patients who learn to read letter by letter and word by word actually get uh, to where they can read just about as fast as they could uh, before this happened. It just takes them. That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. A lot of the, the different low vision aids and, and the continue using them, if, if you start, you know, when you don't need a lot of magnification. Um, a lot of people say, well, you know, um, I, I'll get into all this stuff. I'll, I'll learn how to use my eyes better. I'll learn how to use magnifiers once my eyes are stable or once I need, once I need those things. Well, the truth is, is the earlier you start learning these these techniques and learning how to read one letter at a time, word by word, um, and getting more proficient with that, the better you'll be. Um, if we wait until someone is stable, unfortunately, a lot of my patients, their eyes are, are just never going to be completely stable. And so, as a general rule, different conditions can do different things to how they affect the vision. Um, we always um, say conditions like macular degeneration, you know, the big thing that it does is it affects the central vision. And so what I mean by that is patients are often able to see details, or not see details, they can see peripherally. Um, they can see, hey, there's a person over there, there's a chair over there, um, but I can't tell who that person is. Okay, and so um, conditions like macular degeneration that affect the central vision really affect what I call the detailed vision. Now conditions like glaucoma and retinitis pigmentosa they tend to affect the peripheral vision. So, you know, 2020, 2025, um, it would seem that there's not really a big problem. But then you go to test their peripheral vision, and maybe they only have 10 degrees of visual field, and they just can't see off to the side. So when they walk in a room, um, they aren't able to see, hey, there's a person over there, or there's a um, chair over there to sit in. And so depending on what condition you have, uh, can um, dramatically um, change how we're going to help a patient with different with different aids or even how they uh, have to learn how to use their eyes differently. Um, one of the things that we really emphasize in our practice, we have an occupational therapist who works with patients on this, is um, that they patients can be trained on how to find and how to use the vision that still remains. Um, Many of the conditions that we deal with, and in fact most of them, will affect parts of the vision, but not the entire area of vision. Again, macular degeneration, it's going to affect the central vision, but people usually tend to have very good peripheral vision. So if we can learn how to use that peripheral vision more effectively, that can be important. Um, we have to be careful with over-promising on that part of it. 
Um, unfortunately, I've seen things out there where patients are told that if they learn how to use their peripheral vision or if special prism glasses are put into the glasses just right, um, we can help them use their peripheral vision and they can regain 20-20 vision. Well, that's not really true. Uh, the peripheral retina, the part of the retina that's not damaged in macular degeneration, is actually um, not designed for 20-20 vision. Um, and so just moving the image out that way can't make it 20-20, but what I tell patients is um, seeing a little bit blurry is better than not seeing at all. And so it is important to learn how to find that healthy vision and, and find it consistently. Um, that's one of the things that a lot of patients ask me. They say, why, why do I have some days where I see quite well and then other days where I don't? And, and sometimes when I, when I start asking them, well, what's different? And, and we find out, well, it turns out on their good days, they're sitting in one chair, and on their bad days, they're sitting on a different one. And it turns out the chair that it works, that their vision works well in, just happens to be at an angle to the television where they naturally line up with a piece of their retina that's still working. Whereas when they sit in the chair that their eyes don't seem as good, it's just at an angle where it lines up with their blind spot. And so it is important to be able to consistently know, hey, I always see better if I look a little bit to the left of things or a little bit to the right. Um, and, and that kind of thing. And we call that eccentric viewing training. And so a person with a normal healthy retina um, typically uses the macula, which is the very center of the retina. I'm reading these slides and get my notes. I'm using my macula to, to read those letters and those words. Um, the reason we use the macula in the center of the retina is that's where the, the highest density of what we call cone um, cells are. You know, a lot of patients have heard of rods and cones. They're the photoreceptors within the retina. The cones are where we get our detailed vision. Well, they're, mo they're very highly concentrated in the macula, and so that's where the details are. A person with an unhealthy macula um, can learn to use a more peripheral part of the retina in order to see more clearly than if they're using their blind spot, okay? Um, when we're teaching people eccentric viewing, um, one of the natural inclinations people have is to move their head one way or the other to try to find the clearest peripheral area. We call them the peripheral retinal loci. Um, and so a lot of patients will say, you know, my mother had this, and I always remember she always uh, had her head turned way to the left when she was watching TV. Well, she was trying to use eccentric viewing. And that is a good way of doing it. Um, we do find that if, if people will learn um, to just move their eye over to the side. Uh, sometimes that can be a more effective, more efficient way of always finding the good spot. Um, it's also a little easier on the neck. Okay, And so we have some different tools that we use to help try to identify um, where the, the distorted areas are or where the blind spots are in the retina. Visual field test um, that helps with that. There's a, a clock technique that's used where um, we, we think of uh, the area that you're seeing um, in the form of a clock, and we find out, you know, we always see better when we're looking um, at 9 o'clock. Instead of looking in the center of the watch, we look towards 9 o'clock, or we look towards 6, or we look towards 3. You know, it depends on, uh, again, where the healthy parts of your retina are. And so um, what we're, we have to break this habit of when you want to see something your whole life, you look at it. Well, now we need to not look at what you want to see, you look a little bit off to the side, okay? And so with this clock technique, we'll, we'll have you look slightly above, slightly below, or to the side, one or the other, and, and, and see which one is the most clear. Um, sometimes, depending on what kind of task you're wanting to do, um, that area might be in a different spot. And the reason for that is when someone is trying to do something that's extremely detailed, like reading very small print, you don't need a lot of retina to do that. You just need a little piece that, that's as close to the center as possible. So it may be that um, some of the macula and the just below the center of the macula is, is spared. And so when you find that spot, you can read real well. But when you go to watch TV on a 40-inch TV, which is a little bit wider area than that little small print you're trying to read, what you need is you need a, a piece of retina that's a little healthier um, than the blind spot area, but also is a little bigger than what you're getting with that little detailed vision. So then you find a, a little area that's, that's bigger than what you're using to read, um, but that is still healthy. And so 
depending on what task we're doing, it could be a different thing. And so each time you're doing a task, if you do this clock technique where you say, okay, here's the television, I'm going to look a little above, now I'm going to look a little left, now I'm going to look a little to the right, now I'm going to look a little down, and find which is the best way for that particular task, and then try to consistently make yourself do it that way. And, and you'll find that things will be more consistently good, and you'll have less of those good days and bad days. It'll be more good days. Um, there are exercises that can be done that involve tracing and identification, um, which will help you learn uh, to use that clearest part of the retina. And, and this is where our occupational therapist does a lot of work on this. Um, there are some, uh, some exciting things on the horizon, I think, um, that are going to be making it so that we're able to train these things even more and more efficiently. So um, this is an area that I think is, is very important. Um, again, just to emphasize this again, because again, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, your detailed vision will not be able to be fully regained, regained just by eccentric viewing training, but it can be greatly improved. And then when you when you pair that with magnification and enhancing contrast and other tools that we've talked about, it makes it better. So if someone is very inefficient at finding the good spot of their eye, and and they're constantly looking like they always did, straight ahead at something, um, and, and we can't get them seeing better than about 2200, well, then they're going to need more magnification. And as you're going to see later in the presentation, needing more magnification is fine. We can get more power, but there are things that make it so that um, that's not as ideal as if we could get away with less magnification. Someone who, that same person who's 2200, if they could learn eccentric viewing and, and maybe get their vision to 20 over 120, um, that's a couple lines better on the eye chart, which is very, very typical. A lot of times if we just learn how to use our eyes better, we can gain a line or two of vision. Um, if that patient at 2120 is going to need less power for their magnification, and because of that, they're going to have a lot of advantages, and we'll go over that in a moment. So this can be a good tool not just to help you uh, use your own eyes better, but help you to use the tools that are available even more even more um, clearly. And so now we have uh, different tests, again, like I was mentioning before, that the actual measure the visual fields. And, and um, for macular degeneration and other macular problems, we tend to run what we call 10-2, where it measures the central 10 degrees of the vision. Um, for patients who have uh, peripheral problems, glaucoma, retinitis pigmentosa, strokes, we'll use 30-2 or even a 24-2 where we're measuring the, the central 24 or 30 degrees. Those go, go out more into the peripheral vision. Um, this is an example of what we would call a 10-2. Um, and for those of you who are able to see this, um, in the upper right part of the picture, that's probably the most uh, important thing to see, there's a circle. And in that circle, on the right-hand segment of it, there's a very black, dark area. And what that's showing is this patient um, happens to have a very large blind spot um, in that area. Now, what we notice right away is that that spot seems to be on the right-hand side and not on the left-hand side. The left-hand part of the circle is still very light gray, meaning there's still a lot of visual function there. The question here is, is, is that really how the retina is set up? Is, is it perfectly set up so that that blind spot only happened on the right part of the central vision? or did this patient during this test already show how to do some eccentric viewing? And, and really, that's probably what happened here. Because when we do this test, we say, okay, there's a, there's a big bright light right in the center of the machine. Look at that. Well, when the patient looks with that blind spot that we're showing there, there is no light. <clears throat> and so what they've learned to do is this patient was probably moving the center of their retina over to the right a little bit by looking probably an inch or two to the right of that light. And so they're demonstrating that they've already, even though they have this large blind spot, they've probably learned that when they look to the right of things, it's a little better. And so, so when I see a result like this, basically what I'm able to do is show the patient and say, look, you have this big blind spot. Clearly your brain has adapted where you're learning how to look to the right. Let's make sure we're doing that. Consciously think about, I need to look to the right of things to see. And, and so the more information like these visual fields we have and, and, and the ability to 
see where the, the good part of your vision is, the better we're able to train that. And again, there's, there's lots of new tools that are, that are available and that are coming out that are going to make it even better to work with. Um, so the, the, the whole reason for spending that much time talking about learning how to find good spots in your eye is because when we learn how to find those good spots and we get consistent with that, we're able to use magnification better. Now magnification is typically what people come to me for and what they think they're going um, to get. Um, and, and, and it is truly what I do. Um, but if I don't address contrast and lighting um, and using the eyes more efficiently and glare control and, and even sound, um, magnification is not going to be as useful. And so that's why it is important to spend um, plenty of time talking about that. Um, but the truth is, magnification is very important when it comes to helping someone um, see through their visually impaired eyes. The reason for that is, is you know, when you make something bigger, um, it's making it so that the brain is getting more of the image. And so even though part of the eye is damaged or distorted, the brain is getting enough of the image that's not distorted that it can actually filter the, the distortion right out. I have a lot of patients that'll um, they'll be reading for me and they say, boy, the lines are kind of swimming, they're jumping around, um, they're moving all around. And then we get a magnification and they say, hey, they settled down, now they're not moving. Well, nothing's changed with the words themselves. What's changed is the words are now being um, expressed on the retina big enough that they're no longer um, as distorted because the brain is filtering out the distortion because it's getting enough of the image to be able to do that. So when we do magnification, there, there's three main types of magnification that we can use. Relative distance, relative size, and angular magnification. Okay? Um, relative distance magnification is a pretty simple concept. Uh, the closer you get to things, the bigger they are in your retina. Okay? And so if I'm standing um, 10 feet away from something, well, I use this example to patients all the time with their television. I ask them, how far away do you sit from your television? And they say, oh, it's about 12 feet, and you know, I can't read that writing on the bottom. And I say, well, what about when you get up to 3 feet? Oh, yeah, I can read it when I do that. Well, what they've done when they've gone from 12 feet to 3 feet, they've made themselves four times closer to the image. Well, guess what? They've made that image four times bigger in their eye. It would be the exact same thing as if they sat back at 12 feet and held up four times binoculars to their eyes. Okay? And so we're constantly encouraging people to get closer. One of the main ways that I use relative distance magnification is with stronger glasses. A lot of my patients, they come in and, and, and their doctors have said, sorry, we can't go stronger. And what most uh, doctors will prescribe will be up to what I call a plus three ad, which means about plus three diopters more power than what their distance prescription is. Um, to understand that, a plus three a reading prescription over your distance power would focus you right about probably 12 to 14 inches. Okay? Well, if I move you from 12 inches up to 6 by giving you stronger glasses that are focused in closer, um, that makes it so that um, that, mac that that same set of words is now twice as big because you went from 12 inches to 6. And so that's why stronger glasses often help. It's not necessarily because the, the lens itself is magnifying, it's because it's allowing you to get that um, shorter distance um, and, and you're using relative distance magnification. Okay? And this is the first thing I always try uh, with patients. I try to see, okay, you want to read, well let's try some stronger reading glasses. <clears throat> Sometimes all I have to do is go from the normal 16 inches that people have, which is a 2.5 reading prescription, and I just put them up to about 10 to 12 inches, and suddenly now they can read the paper. And just those, you know, four to six inches of, of, of bringing it closer can make a huge difference in how well someone can see. And so relative distance magnification is something that we use. Another thing we can use, relative size magnification. Well, that's a simple one. It's making things physically bigger. Okay? So the, the main place you would see this would be in large print items. <laughs> this is someone who has a pill bottle. Uh, the writing on pill bottles is notoriously small. And so what they do when they get their bottle is they put a sticker on it and they write in very large letters what it is. And that makes it easier. Here's a large print remote control. Okay? 
Um, that makes it a lot easier to see the buttons. It also uh, keeps it from getting lost in the couch cushions as easily. Okay. So relative distance, relative size magnifications are very important. Angular magnification, that's really the one that most people think of. And, and what that is is the object itself is not actually made larger, and it's not actually necessarily brought closer. But what's happening is an optical system is being placed between the object and the eye to make the eye bigger. Examples of that would be a handheld magnifier, a telescope, and electronic magnification. Some people would uh, separate electronic magnification out as a fourth type of magnification, but for this lecture's purposes, I have it combined with angular magnification. Uh, handheld magnifiers, they're something everybody seems to be familiar with. They're the kind of magnifiers you, you hold on to and get in focus. Um, they, they work really well um, for very short tasks like spotting a price tag or a label in a store. The, the limitations to them um, would be the stronger the magnifier is, the smaller it is. And I would say that's the biggest challenge to using a handheld magnifier. Um, if you need um, any significant amount of power, you're really limiting the field of view. And we're going to see that we do have options available that don't do that. But in actual optical handheld magnifiers, that, that's the big limitation with them. And one thing that has made handheld magnifiers more um, helpful is the, the LED lighting that, that's now put in them. Oops. Sorry about that. Something happened to my slideshow. I'll just get it back to the slide I was on. There we go. Um, here's the stand magnifiers. Stand magnifiers are just like handheld magnifiers where they're using a lens to magnify something. The difference is, is they rest right on the paper. Uh, they tend to work very well. Um, with stronger powers because uh, they're a little steadier. Uh, one of the dis disadvantages to using stand magnifiers, though, is you do have to use them with the right reading prescription. Um, if you're not using the right reading prescription with them, you're not getting the full amount of power out of stand magnifiers. Um, the other thing is, is they do have the same limitation as handheld magnifiers. The stronger they are, the smaller the lens is, the smaller the field of view. And that's, that's the big limitation to all optical magnifiers. Uh, sometimes we'll use telemicroscopes, which are essentially binoculars that are focused up close. This is a picture of someone using those. They're a lot like uh, what you see your surgeon wearing or your dentist, um, you know, a loop that's, that's focused up close. The advantage to telemicroscopes is you don't have to hold things quite as close. Um, the biggest disadvantage to them is, is they do have a very narrow field of view, um, so you're not seeing much of the sentence or much of the word. Um, the other disadvantage to them is they do decrease the amount of light that gets to the retina, um, which can be a problem. Telescopes themselves are used to see things far away, um, and there's three main types of telescopes. There are uh, handheld um, monocular telescopes is typically what we, we do, um, but sometimes we will use binoculars. Um, and those are, are nice for spotting things off in the distance. However, um, if you're um, not very steady with them, that can be a problem. Spectacle mounted glass uh, telescopes are helpful because they can actually be worn like glasses. The disadvantage to those is you can't walk around wearing them. Um, and then um, bioptic telescopes are the third type. Uh, bioptic telescopes are, are nice because they're actually mounted into the glasses, so they're very steady when you use them. All you have to do is point your chin down a little bit, and now you're seeing through them. Um, one of the reasons why people hear about bioptic telescopes is uh, there are some states that allow uh, patients to use them for driving. Um, the process to become a driving a driver with bioptic telescopes is, is typically a pretty involved one, and, and rightly so. We need to make sure that uh, the people who are using them can be safe with them. Um, but uh, it, it can be a good tool for uh, spotting objects off in the distance. Now, the, the last type of angular magnification I want to get into is what we call video magnification, or CCTVs. And this is really where my um, industry, as a doctor who practices low vision um, and does uh, evaluations of people who are visually impaired all day long, uh, really the, the electronics is where uh, we're going. And that's mostly because there are some major inherent advantages to electronic magnification. Um, 
Uh, one of those is obviously we can get a lot of magnification. Some of our desktop magnifiers, um, we can get up to 72 times magnification. Now that's not usually functional, um, except for if you're doing something very detailed like coin collecting or that kind of thing. But um, we're able to get as much magnification as we would possibly need. Whereas with optical magnification, there are some limits to how many um, diopters or how much power we can actually put into the lens. Um, another big advantage of video magnification is um, they do help speed up reading speed. Um, and, and the reason for that mostly is because you're able to get a much wider field of view um, with electronic magnification than you can with um, optical magnification. What I mean by that is if I have an optical magnifier that magnifies something um, five times, um, well, frankly, I'm not going to be able to see much more than about one word of print typically, depending on what size that print is. Um, if I'm using electronic magnification, a desktop CCTV um, at five times magnification, I'm going to be able to see that entire column very easily. And so uh, there's less moving around to find the next word. And, and because of that, the, the reading speed is, is improved. Um, another big advantage um, and major reason why we do a lot of electronic magnification in our practice is the image polarity can be reversed and increased contrast. What I mean by that is we can take gray and black newspaper print and make it white and black or make it black and white or even blue and yellow or black and yellow. There's lots of different colors we can use. Um, but the, the key is, is we're enhancing that contrast. So we're taking a low craft contrast item and we're making it extremely high contrast. And, and we just can't do that with optical magnifiers. Lighting helps in op optical magnifiers. Like I said, the LED light uh, has improved that with optical magnifiers, but it still doesn't come close to the contrast we're able to get with electronic magnification. Um, and so basically, we can take small print and convert it to large print. That's high contrast. And so um, the other thing that's nice about electronic magnification is they do typically come in, in, in forms where we're able to change the magnification. And so if you are having fluctuations in vision, um, we are able to adjust for that by making things bigger or smaller. Um, just a summary of advantage of video magnification, you get a bigger working distance. We tend to not have to be as close to these things as we do with some of the magnifiers that we use or the strong reading prescriptions I'd prescribe. Um, they tend to work with computers. Um, now we have ones that are portable, um, which is very helpful for shopping and going in restaurants and, and things like that. Um, they can capture images, which is a, a nice feature where you can actually take a picture of what you're trying to see and bring it closer to you. Um, in the stores, I'm always talking to patients about when they're shopping and they say, yeah, I have to lay down on the ground to see the prices on the bottom shelf. Well, with a lot of our portable um, devices that I'm going to show you, we are able to just hold that right up to the price tag, take a picture of it, and then you can bring it up closer to you without having to get down on the floor. Um, students who are studying and they want to see what the board, uh, what's written on the board, they can capture the image of that board and then later go back and review it. Um, distance vision can be used with some of our, our devices where we can point the cameras off in the distance. Again, that's very helpful, helpful in presentations um, or classroom settings. Um, some of my patients even uh, use it to look out in New York and see the hummingbird be there that they've hang, hung up. Okay? And then the OCR technology, which is a new feature where the actual devices read to you. Um, some disadvantages of, of electronic magnification cost. Well, they do cost more than optical magnifiers naturally because there's a camera and a, a screen involved. Um, that cost is, is coming closer. You know, our our most expensive optical magnifier, frankly, is, is barely, um, I'd say, less than $100 less than what our um, least expensive electronic magnifier is. And so the, the price range is, is, is actually coming closer and closer through the years. The other thing is, is there are options available to help with the cost. Uh, many state agencies help with them. Um, the VA is a very good system for getting electronic magnification through. Um, and so there are ways to help with financing the cost of them. And, and the truth is, is um, for what they do and, and the amount of independence that they can give, uh, really the, 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 they're worth every cent that would be paid. Um, portability used to be something people listed, but that's not a problem anymore because we have ones that are small enough to fit in your pocket. 
Um, I've had patients say, well, they're hard to use. Well, that's not really true. They're, they're very, very, very user friendly. And so what we're going to go through is we're going to go through some examples of some of the different electronic magnification devices that are available and, and, and why we would use different ones in different situations. Um, one of the ones that our practice uh, probably does uh, more than just about any other option um, is the Da Vinci. Um, the Da Vinci uh, is uh, one of our favorites because it's able to do uh, many different things. Um, it has a camera that allow what we call a three-in-one camera where it's, it's able to look, you can point it off in the distance so you can see images off in the distance. We have patients who you know, they, they know they can sit up close to their TV, but they don't want to because it, it gets in the way of everybody else. Well, they can have their, their uh, Da Vinci set up on a, a, a tray or a table next to their chair that they watch TV on and point that camera, and they can see that TV screen and, and, and not get in everybody's way. Um, that's not exactly the, what the distance camera is, is completely set up for, but it actually works very well for that. Um, again, in classroom settings, that distance camera can, can really help. Um, the, the second feature of three-in-one is you can uh, look at yourself. Um, you can point this at yourself and, and you can do makeup or shave. Uh, one of the neat uh, parts about that is it actually flips the image around as if you're looking in a mirror. Um, so it would be the exact same thing as uh, looking in a mirror. It makes it a lot easier to use. The, the third feature in the three-in-one camera is that you can read with it and put near do near tests. So the camera points down and you're able to see um, printed material and that kind of thing. Um, one of the big advantages to the DaVinci is it does have an HD camera that just provides a really crystal clear picture. And, and the colors um, are, are very, very easy to see. Um, and so uh, one of the things that my patients uh, use a lot of, uh, or use this device for a lot, is looking at pictures. Um, at the end of my evaluations with patients, uh, I have a reputation for showing pictures of my daughters um, uh, to patients under the the machine just to show them how well um, that you can see uh, faces. Patients who say, I can't see people's faces, well, I put pictures of my daughters under that machine and they are able to see them and, and they always give me a, a lot of uh, you know, good feedback that I, that I do have some pretty daughters there. So um, You can uh, also use the DaVinci um, to uh, have it read to you because it does have OCR technology where you push a button, it takes a picture of the image and then it reads it back to you. And so if you're having a day where your eyes are especially tired or fatigued, um, you can use it for that. Um, the camera is a Sony HD camera. It is autofocus, which is very helpful. Um, the screen is a 24-inch resolution HD. Um, the quality is just uh, more clear than what we were able to get in the past. Um, the reading zone preview, uh, that's one of the improvements on the OCR they've done now where they can, uh, it takes a picture and you're able to preview where you're able to see. Um, there are literally 28 different viewing modes you can create um, with the DaVinci depending on what color and contrast and size um, that you're going to want to use, which, which really makes it a lot more versatile to do a lot of different tasks. Um, and you can uh, slide the camera from one way to the other, or one side to the other. Um, a lot of our artists will use this where they'll point the camera at the easel that they're pointing at. Um, and because the camera moves and slides, it makes it a lot easier to do that. Another uh, CCTV um, that works very well that we use a lot of is the Merlin HD OCR Elite. Um, the Merlin is, again, it's a, it's a high performance desktop video CCTV. Um, it has an HD camera and it does have the text, text to speech uh, technology, which is the OCR technology. Um, again, I just can't say enough about how clear these images are. We get used CCTVs in our office sometimes, um, and, and when I look at the used ones and I think, wow, I, I remember when I liked these um, three years ago, um, and now I look at them and I think, how did we ever use those? Um, because the new, the new cameras and the new screens are, are just so dramatically more clear and, and better that, that uh, you know, when you put them side by side, just one that was just three years ago, it's, it's amazing how much different the, the technology is now. Um, and again, just experience that joy of reading with the push of a button. Um, it's using the same Sodi HD camera that's autofocus. Um, I, I like the Merlin for patients who are going to be doing a lot of reading. You know, people who really want to read books, read newspapers. Um, there's just something about having that that big screen and that tray that moves so smoothly and it just it's a very natural
feel. Um, the buttons are easy to use and, and just seem to be where you would expect them to be. Um, and it's very intuitive in how to learn how to use them. Um, and so the Merlin is one that when, when we do that with patients, it tends to be because they're someone who, frankly, they're not too interested in doing makeup on themselves or, or looking off in the distance. They just really want to read. And, and that's what these Merlins are, are really, really good for. Um, there is a, another version of the Merlin, the LCD and HD. It doesn't have the OCR technology, um, but again, it still has that large magnification range and large field of view. Uh, it's enhancing the contrast. The tray moves very easily, and the controls are very easy to use. Um, it's an excellent option, again, for near tasks, for reading, writing, looking at photos. I mean, you, if you want to do those things, the, the, any of the different types of Merlins can do them. Um, you know, when you go from the Merlin HD to LCD, there's a little difference in camera. Um, but, um, and uh, we can also get different monitor sizes with these different versions. So um, obviously one of the big things that's different with the different Merlins is there are different price tags associated with them. And so what you would do is you would talk to whoever the uh, representative for enhanced vision is um, in your area, and they would be able to give you prices that are different. But, you know, these Merlins, the magnification range is literally from about two and a half times magnification all the way up to 85 times, okay, and, and depending on what size your monitor is. Um, another thing that's nice about the Merlin is the screen does pivot, and, and it can move both horizontally and vertically. And that can make it so that you're, when you're sitting at your desk or using it, you can make it more comfortable. Um, some people will have these on their kitchen counters uh, to be able to read um, uh, recipes because cooking is their life. Well, they're able to turn that monitor over to the side and, and not have to walk in front of it every time to see it. And so um, there are seven different viewing modes with these. And, and you know, as far as warranties, I guess it's a three-year warranty. Now, um, the Acrobat was kind of the precursor to the uh, Da Vinci. Um, when the Acrobat came out, uh, it really did create what, what we considered a, a new class of CCTV because we never had a desktop CCTV that was as portable as the Acrobat was. Um, in Arizona, a lot of our patients, they live here uh, during our very nice winters and they leave during our very hot summers. Well, those patients were faced with either having to buy two CCTVs, one for each place they live, or um, not having one for certain parts of the year. Um, well, with the Acrobat, it, it it was finally something we could actually use that they could travel with um, and, and um, take from one, one home to the other. Um, it has a lot of the same um, features that the Da Vinci did um, as far as the uh, three-in-one camera. Um, and so it's very good with uh, reading and writing. One of the things I like about both the Acrobat and the Da Vinci is, is it's open space underneath the camera. So, so when you're actually working with your hands, I have a lady who hand sewed uh, some quilts that were um, as large as, as, as uh, the wall in our office um, that she brought in and showed a bunch of our patients um, that she sewed right underneath that camera. And, and just the fact that you're in open space underneath it makes it much easier to do that kind of task. Um, the, the camera, you can again have, you move it to look at yourself as a, to do makeup and shaving. Um, one of the things we, we do with the, with the Acrobat um, with my grandfather is we would point the camera at my daughters. Um, and so not just looking at pictures, um, he could actually look at their faces live and, and, and you know he could see them smiling and sticking their tongue out at them and, and that kind of thing. And, and, and that does, um, make a big difference because you know when you, when you're faced with not being able to see you know your your great granddaughters that that can be a, a, a tough thing and so um, the fact that he was able to see them when we pointed that camera at him if we could just keep him still enough to look at it uh, made it a big big difference for him and again with the Acrobat you can use it for distance vision um, it's using a, a Sony HD camera that's three in one um, just like we said before. One of the things that's nice about the Acrobat at this point is there are 22-inch, 24-inch, and 27-inch um, monitor sizes. That 27-inch monitor size, boy, that, that's a, a pretty, pretty big advantage because um, when you're able to magnify something um, and still see the whole column because you have such a wide screen, that, that makes a big difference. And so um, 27 inches is about as big as it gets when it comes to monitors, when it comes to CCTVs. Um, and with this Acrobat, again, there's 28 different viewing modes. Um, 
we also have line markers, um, which helps people when they're reading um, be able to see where they're reading because um, it underlines the word or isolates a line. There's different ways to do that. And the remote control is pretty easy to use. And the Acrobat has a two-year warranty. Um, the transformer uh, is, is a um, camera that's portable. And what it does is it uses a, a computer, typically, to uh, act as its screen. And so this is one of my favorite ones to prescribe for students um, because what they're able to do is they're able to carry a CCTV around with them um, that's very small and compact. Um, it has all the advantages of the Acrobat um, where it's able to uh, see in the distance and see yourself and see the screen or the, the uh, print. The difference is it's very portable. As you can see when it folds up, it, it just doesn't take up much space. And so another big advantage to the transformer is it's able to capture the images. Just like I was mentioning before, where you're able to have a professor write um, a lot of notes on the board, and yet you're still able to, instead of having to sit there and try to frantically try to see what, it's, what he's writing and then and copying it down, you can take a picture of it and then go back later and um, review the notes. Um, so again, for students and people attending presentations and conferences, this is just the, a, a wonderful option. It weighs less than three pounds, so again, very portable. Um, magnification range is, is absolutely adequate. You can get up to 30 times magnification. That camera rotates literally 330 different degrees for reading, distance, and self-viewing. Um, and you can use it with a laptop, a desktop, or any kind of computer or monitor. Um, and there's 28 different custom modes when you start doing all the different colors. Um, it's battery operated, operated. The charge lasts usually up to about four hours. Um, it has built-in LED lighting. So even if you're in a dark classroom, um, it has its own lighting. Um, and the, the software for it, it, it plugs in with a USB uh, plug that, that literally is plug and play. And it has a two-year warranty. Um, the Amigo um, has always been one of our, our very important um, portable CCTVs. The reason it's a great portable option is it is something you can carry around and it's literally one of the biggest screens you can get um, in a portable device. One of the things I like about the Mego is the screen pivots up and down so you are able to get it at an angle that's comfortable for you when you're reading. Here's someone who's reading a pill bottle with their Amigo. Um, again, it's a very large portable CCTV um, so it gives you a very large field of view considering it is a portable option. Um, and it can actually be connected to a TV monitor for an even bigger field of view. Um, and you're able to freeze images, again, which is very helpful uh, in stores. I also have patients use the freeze uh, option for when they're trying to dial a phone number. They'll take a picture of the phone number, and then it'll be magnified in large form and steady when they're going to dial it. It's a nice, crisp, high-definition image. It's lightweight and portable. Uh, the magnification range is somewhere between about 3.5 times to 14 times magnification. The screen itself is about six and a half inches, and it is an anti-glare LCD screen. Um, and that tilting uh, is a very important uh, feature to be able to uh, be more comfortable when you're using it. Um, and it has six different viewing modes in a two-year warranty. The Pebble HD um, is, is one of the newer options we have in portable CDs. TVs. Um, some of you, you listening to this may have a pebble and you're thinking that does not look like my pebble. Well, that, the design of it has been revamped. Um, the, the handle has been changed. It's a little lighter weight. The buttons uh, are very uh, accessible and easy to use. Um, and so, but it's the same idea where it's a very lightweight, portable CCTV that can be used for just about any task you're going to need in here. Um, the new HD camera provides a nice, crisp, clear, colorful, um, picture, um, and it is very ergonomic and lightweight. Um, uh, one of the things that's very good about it is, is when you're moving um, the camera around, you just don't see any ghosting or anything like that, which is often something that you have to deal with with some of the portable CCTVs. Um, really, the Pebble is something that eventually, um, as the years go by, um, this kind of device will um, make it so that we just don't do nearly as many optical magnifiers and, and, and the reason is is the advantages to it are just so much better than optical magnifiers. Um, you know, uh, the, the bigger field of view, the enhanced contrast, the fact that they're just as light a weight, um, 
you know, there's just going to be no reason why someone is going to use electric or uh, optical magnifier when they can use the cameras. Um, you know, it, it hasn't replaced it yet, but like I said, I think as technology gets better and better, um, you know, it, it is going to be where we go. Um, Pebble and the Pebble Mini. There's a Pebble Mini I didn't mention um, where it's even smaller. <laughs> it can literally fit in my, my shirt pocket. Um, these are all good devices for reading menus. You know, that's one of the things that patients complain about the most is I can't read menus because the lighting is poor. Well, they're self-lit and they're able to magnify things quite large. Um, Magnification on the pebble can be anywhere from one and a half, 1.25 times magnification to 13 and a half times. And sometimes getting it at that low magnification can be a big improvement because when you're when you're trying to read a column and you just need a little bit extra, well, that's where that two times magnification can really be helpful. Um, it's lightweight. The screens, depending on which version you're getting, can be a three inch or a four and a half, 4.3 inch uh, screen. Um, it's giving you just a, a pretty large viewing area, even though it's a small, um, lightweight um, item. And, and then that new handle is much easier to open and close and, and, and grab. And uh, it does have a freeze image um, with the ability to magnify and change mode. And, and I know um, some of them are even uh, telling you what time it is now out loud. So, so that's an overview of, of some of the different options that are available. Again, um, whether it's using contrast to your advantage, using illumination, um, controlling your glare, um, using sound, uh, learning how to use those eyes and find that good spot, um, or using magnification. All of those are tools, and, and whether or not you need to use all of them or some of them, that's going to depend on what your goals are. But the fact is, is you need to embrace those tools um, so that we can uh, keep you as independent as possible. And if, with that, um, I am actually done with my presentation. If you're interested in any of those uh, devices we talked about, um, there will be uh, the ability to schedule um, uh, in-home demonstrations, and you can find uh, low vision providers in your area. Enhanced Vision has a very good um, network of, of people who provide these things. And I think we're going to probably open it up to a little bit of time for questions and answers at this point. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Hoff. It was a wonderful presentation. And we do have some questions. Um, our first question is, why can't visually impaired patients use prescribed eyewear? Okay, so the question is, why can't visually impaired patients use prescribed eyewear? And, and, and I guess um, my answer to that would be some can. And, and um, a lot of times when patients are told, we can't go stronger or we can't do anything more for you, um, we still can. And, and when we do a, a trial frame refraction, we're able to fine tune things a little better. I would say in our practice, about 45% of patients who have been told glasses won't help, we are able to get a better prescription. And, and some of that is just because um, a doctor who doesn't prescribe or pr practice low vision optometry um, doesn't tend to do stronger reading prescriptions than about a plus 3.0. Um, and because of that, they're just not getting the magnification that they need. Now, the reason they don't do that is you need to be doing that every day to, to know how to do it and know how to make it successful. And so um, a lot of times we are able to do that. Now, when it comes to things like distance vision, uh, I tell patients, glasses fix two things. If your eyeball is too long or too short or too flat or too curved, that's what glasses for distance vision are correcting. But notice I'm not saying anything about scarred retinas or um, damaged optic nerves. Glasses don't fix that. And so with the distance vision, we can give you your power, but no more or no less. And at that point, then we have to get into magnification because the only thing that can help at that point would be magnification. So the answer is, well, sometimes we can improve things with glasses, but if we can't, it's just because glasses don't fix damaged retinas and damaged optic nerves. And, and if that's the case, we have to go to magnification to do that. Okay, next question is, when and where will stem cell cure for wet MD be available? Boy, that, that's, a, that's a big question, isn't it? When, when and where will this come? Um, there are some very promising things happening um, as we speak um, in the, the treatment of conditions like macular degeneration and some of our other ones. Um, there was a, a pretty promising uh, study 
pilot study that was done at UCLA um, over the last few years uh, where they showed that, that uh, stem cells do have enough potential to help with this condition that it would be worth going into FDA trial. And, and um, they are ramping up some of the starts of some of the FDA trials. Now, the way our, our process works, there, there are several phases in, involved in the FDA trials where we first test to make sure that uh, things can be done safely. Once they can show that they've been done safely, then they show that they can do it at the therapeutic doses that would be needed um, and still be safe. And then once that's proven, then they actually try to really try to start helping people. And, and the process is there because, well, frankly, we don't like um, hurting people or blinding people or killing people in the name of science. And so there are necessary steps that need to go, but those steps are occurring. Um, as the FDA trials uh, start to ramp up, you will see um, them becoming more available uh, across the country. Um, and so as far as a timeline, well, that, that's going to be hard to predict because if there's any setbacks along the way, um, that can slow things down. Um, we, uh, in, in my, my industry, boy, we're all very optimistic about what's to come. Uh, but we've been optimistic about things before that didn't work out. So um, we're cautiously optimistic, but, but the steps do need to be made. Um, people often ask me, well, should I go to China? And, uh, you know, I, I just say, or Europe or somewhere else. And, and I say, well, um, I promise you that the doctors we have here are desperate to fix this, this disease um, and the disease that we're dealing with. And so um, it will be uh, on the market as soon as is possible with also being safe um, because there are a lot of uh, financial incentives to whoever uh, figures out how to cure these diseases. And one more question. Do eye exercises help um, strengthen the eyes? Okay. The question is do eye exercises help strengthen the eye? Um, what I would answer with that is, is there is a whole branch of, of optometry called vision therapy and, and, and that is designed to help people who have certain deficits with how their eyes work as a team. Unfortunately, vision therapy does not improve when you have visual impairment. Um, now, the, the parts of the eye that are damaged in most of what we're working with, you know, the retina, the optic nerve, that's nerve tissue. And nerve tissue is not the kind of tissue like muscle that can be exercised. But I will say this, um, nerve tissue that isn't used uh, often atrophies faster. So it is important to use your eyes. Um, now, kind of in the same branch of exercising is like what we were describing is learning to use your eyes more efficiently is kind of like exercising. And again, that's something that um, we're getting more and more knowledge about how to train people how to do that. And I think you'll be seeing some, uh, some pretty exciting ways that we'll be able to do that in the future. Um, but that's something that, I, that that's got a lot of momentum in my field is, is just learning how to find the good parts of the eye. Again, you're not strengthening what you have um, because that's just not possible with nerve tissue. But what we're doing is we're helping you use what you have more efficiently. So in a way, it's kind of like exercises. Um, we have a question from quite a few people, um, and one of them is, where can I find resources to help me pay for some of the magnification tools? Um, we have it on our website. If you go to enhancedvision.com and you look on the left-hand side, it'll say low vision resources. If you click on that button, there are resources all listed by state, um, and you're able to click uh, right into your state and look at all the organizations that may be able to provide some assistance for you. Um, one other question is people are asking, how much does the Pebble HD cost? and does it run with battery? Um, yes, the Pebble HD does run by battery. It's completely portable. It kind of plugs in just like your cell phone in the evenings. And the cost of the new Pebble HD is $595. Um, so I want to thank Dr. Huff very much for his time and always very, very interesting and informative webinar. And I wish all of you a great day. Um, this webinar will be posted on YouTube. If you go to youtube.com, type in enhanced vision, um, it will be posted on our YouTube channel. So again, thank you all for your time and listening, and thanks again, Dr. Huff. We truly enjoy your webinars. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Bye-bye.